All right, I'm going to take an instant poll. Raise your hand if you have ever heard the expression that used to ascribe to someone calling them a doubting Thomas. Raise your hand. You ever heard that expression? All right. That's, that was the easy question. Now the hard question is, have you ever been called a doubting Thomas? Now you don't have to raise your hand about that. Well, today we take up the disciple Thomas and what he required in order to believe that Christ had actually and physically been raised from the dead. But before we take up Thomas, let's consider the centrality of the resurrection itself to Christianity. It has been said that the resurrection is the pivotal event of all history, that without it, there would be no Christianity. I mean, Paul certainly understood that. Paul knew that better than anyone. And we take that, as a matter of fact, if we go to 1 Corinthians, which isn't our text for today, but it's a lead into our text for today, we see Paul dealing with this issue. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. I think one of the reasons I like Paul is he had such a legal mind. He reasoned from point to point to conclusion. And there we have a great example of it. During his ministry, Jesus had said that he came to bring life. He came that those who might have life, those who believe in him might have life and have it abundantly. He said that he is the resurrection and the life. That whoever believes in him, though they die, yet shall they live. And that anyone who believes in him shall never die. So Jesus said, had said on multiple occasions also that, that he would be handed over into the hands of evil men and that he would be killed and on the third day be raised. So he said, he, I am the resurrection and the life. You can count on that. I'm going to be handed over into the hands of evil men. I'm going to be killed and on the third day be raised. He said that multiple times. So Jesus had said, and Jesus had said, and then Jesus had said, and then there he was up on that cross, bracketed by two criminals, and then he was dead. I mean, really dead. The not breathing, taken down and wrapped in linen, put in a tomb, and the stone rolled into place, kind of dead. And then those words, all those words he had said, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, as it's sometimes called, the teachings in the temple, the multiple roastings of the Pharisees, that final discourse with the eleven on the night before he would be crucified and on the third day be raised. All those words for his immediate followers, for his family and for his friends, with Jesus dead and in the tomb, those words must have seemed like, well, just words. Now we're going to come to Thomas in a bit, but I want to first, I want us first to consider how the others who were in Jesus' immediate circle, leaving Thomas aside, let's take a look at how those in Jesus' immediate circle reacted to his death 
and then to the first reports of his crucifixion. If you read the Gospels, all four Gospels deal with the, the resurrection in some way or another. And if I were to read all of those, all of those accounts, you'd be late for lunch and mad at me. <laughs> and mad at Larry for letting me get up here and talk to you about that. So let me deal with them for the most part in summary form. But if you want to read those accounts, either for homework or to, as the people of Berea to see if what I'm telling you is true, you can find those accounts in, in, in this way, in these places. In Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, and guess what, in John chapter 20, which is where we find today's text. From those accounts considered together, this is what we gather. Let's start with the women. They came to the tomb early on that first Sunday after the crucifixion. Now, why did they come? Did they come so they could have ringside seats to watch Jesus as he emerged from the tomb? No, they came bringing burial ointments so they could complete the burial process. But when they got there, what did they find? They found an empty tomb, and then they remembered that Jesus said he was going to be raised on the third day, and they believed, right? No, wrong. That's not what happened. They didn't believe until they were confronted by angels, and then Jesus himself in the flesh, then they believed. And both the angels and Jesus told the women, go back and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen, that he is alive. And they did as they were told. They went back and they told the disciples, the Lord has risen, the Lord is alive. And then the disciples immediately remembered Jesus' words and they believed, right? Carol shaking her head, she knows the right answer. She's in my Sunday school class, I might want to pay attention to that. Luke records the, the disciples' examples very nicely in chapter 24, verse 11. He says, the women's words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe. They went back and told the disciples, and the disciples said, get out of town. I mean, basically, it's an idle tale. You've just made that stuff up. So the women had doubted, and had come to the tomb that morning not to witness the resurrection, but to complete the burial process. They had gone back and told the disciples that he, they had actually seen the risen Christ, and the, risen, and the disciples who had been with Jesus day in, day out for three years, said, oh, wow, that, what he told us all those times was true. No, they doubted. They called it an idle tale. They did not believe the women. So they, had both, they both doubted Jesus' word, and they, brought, they doubted the testimony from the women that Jesus had kept his word. So with all that as background, let us take up the first part of today's text, which we find in chapter 20, in verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad. Then they saw the Lord. And we're going to continue with verses 24 and 25. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not there with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So the verses we've just read cover the first encounter that the disciples as a group had with the risen Christ. And this first encounter happened on the evening of what we call Easter Sunday. All the disciples except Thomas are there huddled in the room with a door lock for fear of what the Bible says, the fear of the Jews. In other words, fear of the same people who put Jesus on the cross. I think in retrospect, they probably gave themselves too much credit. Uh, because I don't think the Pharisees were, and the scribes and, the, and so forth were worried about them. <clears throat> but there among them appears Jesus. And Jesus, what does he do? He shows them his hands and he shows them his, his side. But it's a very brief description in John. Let's take a look at how Luke describes this and it gives us more detail. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. 
And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. So, as I say, John's encounter was very brief. He just basically, Jesus said, John tells us that Jesus showed them his hands and uh, his side. But Luke's account is more detailed. Jesus comes to, to them. They think he's a spirit. Jesus realizes that. And he says, does the spirit have flesh and bones? See my hands? See my feet? See my side? And by the way, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> I mean, Jesus was very practical. Of course, John makes clear that in this first appearance, in this first uh, Sunday evening, just as an aside, we saw with Luke's as they discussed these things, what precedes Luke's uh, introduction there, or, or the part we, we read, is the, the disciples from Emmaus have come back from their experience with the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus, and actually Jesus comes and interrupts that, that discussion. So Thomas wasn't there. But what must have happened during that week, we don't know why Thomas wasn't there, but during the week that followed, it must be that uh, on multiple occasions, Peter and John and the others shared with Thomas what they had seen. I mean, in detail, over and over again. Can you believe it? And over and over again, they repeated to him over and over again. And Thomas apparently at that point started uh, considering moving to Missouri, the show me state, because <laughs> Peter's reaction, I mean, Thomas's reaction was, in essence, I'll see it when I believe it, and, I mean, I'll, see, I'll believe it when I see it and I touch it. I'll believe it when I see it and I touch it. That was Thomas's reaction. Now, so then a week later, now it, it, we're going we're to see when we start in this next passage, it talks about eight days later, but that's not the following Monday. The way the Jewish calendar, the way the Jews counted the calendar at that time, uh, we, they count the, if you, today, for example, I'm going to count in Jewish terms in eight days from today. I'm counting today as day one. We don't do that in America, uh, and every lawyer knows that. Tomorrow is day one from today. You don't count, the, but the Jews count inclusively. That's, if you ever think about that, that's why Jesus rose on the third day, although it was, he was crucified on a Friday, and he was raised on Sunday. Did you ever wonder about that? Friday is day one. Saturday's day two, Sunday's day three. So the following Sunday, this is what John tells us happened. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Notice that, notice the obvious. It's always good to notice the obvious. Thomas did not disbelieve the risen Christ. Thomas did not say, I see you standing there, but you can't be really standing there. No, he didn't believe, he didn't disbelieve that. When, when Christ physically confronted him in flesh and bone, his, he could only exclaim, my Lord and my God. No, what Thomas doubted was not the risen Christ in the flesh, but Jesus' word, which he had spoken to Thomas and to the others multiple times before the crucifixion. I am the resurrection and the life. I will be handed over into the hands of evil men by the chief priest and scribes and, on the, and be killed and on the third day be raised. How many times has Thomas heard that? It's recorded multiple times in the Gospels. And what's worse, not only did he doubt Jesus' word, he doubted the testimony the, from his fellow disciples who were Jesus' his closest friends by this time and Jesus' closest associates that Jesus had kept his word, that he in fact had risen on the third day. But Jesus' word that he had given to Thomas and the manifold affirmation 
that from the other disciples that Jesus had kept his word were rejected by Thomas. Thomas asserted that he would rely only on his own witness, that he had to see and touch the risen Jesus in order to believe he had, in fact, been raised. So Thomas, in effect, was declaring that Jesus' word wasn't good enough for him. Now, I started today by asking you if you ever heard of, of, of the expression doubting Thomas. But let's talk about doubt for a moment. Doubt has been defined as a lack of confidence in something, a lack of confidence in something or someone, or is considering a, a reported fact or circumstance unlikely to be true. That's, what, that's a common definition of doubt. Doubt's not rare. And that's, that, happen, that happens to all of us from time to time about different things. And actually the wisdom of the world the wisdom of the world actually says that doubt is a good thing. Let's take a look at someone I'm sure you read on a regular basis, <laughs> Rene Descartes, who was a 17th century French philosopher. But it's a common idea. If you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt, as far as possible, all things. Buddhism, religion of the world, teaches doubt everything. Find your own light. So that's what the wisdom of the world would teach us about doubt. It's good. Go for it. Find your own light. My light doesn't have any batteries. I don't know. But, but what does the Bible teach us about doubt? We find doubt first expressed in the Garden of Eden, actually, in chapter 3 of Genesis. But before man encountered his own doubt, he first encountered God's word which we find in chapter 2 of Genesis. This is God speaking to Adam. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And we know from reading Genesis 2 and 3 that Adam took this word that God had given him. He shared it with Eve. Then Eve is out in the garden one day, with Adam, apparently without Adam around, and she encounters the serpent, and the serpent immediately greets her by casting doubt on God's word, calling God's word into question, which is the beginning of doubt, isn't it? And the serpent said to her, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God actually say? Isn't that the beginning of doubt? And then to her, to her credit, Eve did say, well, no, he said that I could, we could eat everything except there's just one tree in the midst of the garden. So she straightens, she straightens the serpent out. She, gets him, she tries to get him back on track, but then the serpent goes right after God directly to, and assaults God's, God himself, his word, and his goodness directly. And this is what the serpent says to Eve. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He said, listen, Eve, you've got to wake up and smell the coffee. God knows he's keeping the good stuff from you. If you eat that fruit that he's keeping from you, you're going to be just like him, and he doesn't want you to be just like him. And every, as every Sunday school veteran in here knows, Eve and Adam... They ate the fruit, but it went beyond just eating the fruit. They embraced, they embraced the doubt that the serpent had brought to them. They embraced it and made it their own, and, 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 and they, they, they internalized it. And, and the rest, as they say, is history, right? And we're still living out that history. But before we try to put all the blame on the devil... We have to remember that the Bible teaches us that we are responsible, each of us, for his or her own doubt. But the Bible also teaches us that God deals with doubt in different ways. Sometimes he deals with punishment. He deals with it by punishing the one who doubts. Re uh, consider, for example, Zechariah, who was rendered mute. You remember Zechariah, right? He was uh, actually John the Baptist's father. He was himself a priest. His wife was uh, Mary's mother of Jesus' cousin, Elizabeth. And when they were both old, um, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, well past the time when they could, they could expect to have a child. 
Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We've encountered that before in the Bible, haven't we? The angel comes to Zechariah as he's in the temple, he's, and Zechariah's in there by himself, and the angel tells him many things, and among them he tells him, you're, you and Elizabeth, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah has this response, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Got any documents with that? I mean, could I see the contract? And the angel rendered him mute until after the baby was born. You may recall, actually, after the baby was born, they wanted to know what uh, Zechariah was going to name the baby. And he said, give me something. To, well, he indicated to give him something to write on. He wrote out the name. It was only after he wrote the name out that he got his voice back. So Zechariah may have known God's word, but he, didn't, he, hadn't, he had not come to trust it. He couldn't, he couldn't accept that God could do the impossible by human standards. And God rendered him mute for a season. I, I find a certain irony in that. Zechariah couldn't take God's word, and so God took his word from him. <laughs> There's a certain irony in that. But for others, actually, and more often in the Bible, God does not meet doubt with punishment, uh, but with patience. And we, we have an excellent example of that. I mean, think of Gideon and the fleece, which we find in the book of Judges. We read the story in Judges chapter 6. Israel is being confronted by the Midianites, and God comes to Gideon and, and encourages him. He wants him to, to raise up, to lead the people of Israel against the Midianites and conquer them. And Gideon, in the great tradition of the Old Testament leaders, many of them, think of Moses, I think you've got the wrong guy, even though God says, I'm going to be with you. So let's take a look at how Gideon can really test God's patience here. Then Gideon said to God, if you will really save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. You get the picture? Gideon says, look, I hear you talking to me, but let's just, can I, I'm going to test you on this. He said, I'm going to put this fleece, this, this sheepskin down, on the threshing floor, and if I wake up tomorrow morning, and the ground, the, all around the threshing floor, it's dry, but the fleece is wet with the dew, then I'll believe you. But he didn't. Then Gideon said to God, after God had met this first test, he said, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test you just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and all on, all on the ground, all around, let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on the ground there was dew. You know what you're thinking? Gideon and Thomas probably live together in Missouri to this day, right? That's not true. <laughs> so Gideon had doubted, Gideon had doubted, and tried God's patience not once, but twice. And God had met. Gideon's doubt, not with punishment, but with reassurance. But while God may be patient with those who doubt, so that their doubt may be overcome, and that they may turn from doubt to faith, he never blesses doubt. Doubt may be met with patience, but it is never met with praise in the Bible. And, that's, and, that, and that we have that here. God, Jesus met, patient, met Thomas, meets Thomas here in our text today with patience, but he doesn't deliver praise to Thomas. You will notice that Jesus did not bless Thomas for believing what he could see. Jesus' blessing was reserved for those who had not seen and yet believed. There's no blessing on Thomas here other than that Christ has indulged him with showing him himself in the flesh. So with all that we have just said in mind, what are we to make of Thomas and how Jesus dealt with him in the text for in, in this next Sunday, this first full Sunday after the resurrection? We, we should keep in mind that what the disciples needed more than anything else in those days after the resurrection, what did that mean after the crucifixion? What did they need, need more than anything else? They needed to know that Jesus had risen from the grave, that he was, in fact, alive. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. He knew, he understood that the disciples needed to be certain that he, in fact, had risen, that he was alive. 
he knew they would be accused by the Jews first, but then by others later, of having made it all up. The disciples rolled away the stone so the story would go. And they took that body and they put it somewhere, and they made up these ridiculous stories about how they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And so the story went, and so it still goes among zealous unbelievers around the world. As an aside, I'll just mention this. How many people in this room would make up a story that they had seen something that wasn't, they knew in their hearts wasn't true, and then go to their own versions of the crucifixion, continuing to tell the lie. That's what happened to the disciples, you know that. They all died for Christ, continuing to say what they knew to be true. Just point that out. We should also keep in mind, though, about Jesus' coming to the disciples, this. To be an apostle, one had to be, one has to be sent. It has to be, you have to, to be an apostle, one has to be sent by, by Christ to bear witness to the one who did the sending. So to be an apostle, one had to have personally witnessed the risen Christ. That was an absolute requirement. So Jesus was patient with his disciples, not just with Thomas, but with all the disciples, because he was going to be sending them out into the world as his messengers. And he knew that they needed to know in their hearts and in their minds that the words he had spoken to them when he was with them were true, that he would, that he would be raised on the third day. I mean, imagine if Jesus had just come and spoken to them in their ear. Uh, this is Jesus, and uh, I've got some work for you to do. And you may die along the way, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you. But just a voice in their ear. That's, Jesus knew that was not going to work for them because it would not prove that he fact had physically, physically came, had come from the tomb, that he lived, that God had kept his word from, from, from the scriptures, that Jesus had kept his word when he was with them, that he in fact had risen from the grave, that he was alive. Jesus knew that they physically had to see the evidence of it. And he gave it to them. As we, rec as we saw in today's opening text, there was a point where 500 people saw the risen Christ all at one time. Now, they weren't all apostles, but they were great witnesses. So Jesus, Jesus met Thomas' doubt, not with punishment, but with patience. But he did so for a purpose, and we've already looked at that purpose, for a purpose that goes way beyond Thomas and time and space. In his high priestly prayer, which Jesus prayed on the night he would be arrested and the next day crucified, speaking of the disciples in that long priestly prayer, which you can find in John 17, Jesus prayed this to the Father. I do not ask for these only. In other words, Heavenly Father, I'm not just asking for these 11 disciples who are with me now, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus was praying for us. That's a prayer for us. That's a prayer for me and you. I've never seen the risen Christ. I've, I've, never, I've never seen Jesus in the flesh. But I, I, but I know this is true. I know this is true. So Jesus was praying for them. And he also prayed for, that to the Father that the Father would send, just as the Father had sent him, that, he, that Jesus was sending those the disciples to be his witnesses out into the world. And Thomas was included in that group. When Jesus prayed that prayer, Thomas was there, and Jesus was praying that prayer for Thomas just as he was for the group. So yes, Jesus, Jesus was patient with Thomas. He was patient with the disciples. And for the reasons that we've said, he knew, they had to, he knew they had to have the evidence to go forward and proclaim it. But Jesus' patience with Thomas should not keep us from realizing a very important lesson. Until Jesus appeared before him, in the risen flesh, Thomas was like countless others who would come after him, like those of our generation, who, if they are to believe, must do so based on the witness they have received from others. Thomas took that test and was found lacking. He had had Jesus' word. He had the scriptures. He had the testimony of the women. He had the testimony of the disciples. And he said, that's not good enough. So if, if Thomas is your standard for believing that Jesus rose from the grave, 
if Thomas is your standard, the, tan the, st the standard he set before he saw Jesus before him, that you have to see him physically, personally, in the flesh, then you're going to have to wait till the day of judgment. When every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, because they're looking at him, just like G Thomas was looking at him, at that point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But on that day, although every tongue will confess and every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord, not everyone who confesses that and, and, set, and, and bows that knee will be welcomed into Jesus' kingdom. If you go to the grave as an unbeliever, or if you're an unbeliever when Christ returns, yes, your knee will bow and your tongue will confess, but after that, you're into the outer darkness, and not just for a little while. You're not in time out. You're in time forever. So as we come to the end of today's message, let us thank God that he is patient. But let us not presume on that patience. Let us not take it for granted. God has given us his son. God has given us his very self. He's given us his word, all of which bear witness to all of that and more. I'll close with this. Bertrand Russell, who was a very well-known British, British philosopher of the last century, but more than that, an avowed, dyed-in-the-wool atheist. Atheist. I mean, he was, he was energetic about being an atheist. And he was at this meeting or at this gathering, and someone stood up and asked him, said, Mr. Russell, if on, if, if on the Day of Judgment you are, in fact, standing before the living God, and he asked you, why did you not believe in me? What would be your response? And Russell said, I looked right at his question and said, I would say, not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. God, you just didn't give me enough evidence. You know, I wish Mr. Russell could be with us today. He's long gone, but if he were living and could be here today, I've got a question for him. I would, I would give him this book. And I would say, sir, is the problem that God has not given you enough evidence? Or is the problem that you have not fully or at all considered the evidence that he has so graciously provided to you? Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that you have given us your word, both your word written and your word in the flesh, that you have given us yourself, that you have come to die for us. And you've given us those, like, those, like the, those, the, those disciples who were your apostles to, to bear witness to you in Judea and throughout the world. And we, we give you thanks that even on, even on the night before you would, you would die, to come back to life again, you prayed for us. And we pray that each one of us here would have it in our hearts to accept the witness that you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.